It's a real pleasure to have uh, Dr. Gerald Alcantara here with us. Um, I've been reading his books over the last few years and wrote a review on his crossover preaching. And I was struck by the underlying assumption that he has when he writes about crossover preaching. He begins by saying that all preachers, he assumes that preachers already strive to be gospel-centered, biblically tethered, exegetically proficient, theologically competent, and spiritually mature. And then he takes off. Then he talks about what's involved with uh, a kind of intercultural discussion in a way that means that we're not rooted in our own tradition, but we're able to cross over. So the Southern Baptist doesn't just sound like a Southern Baptist. The Presbyterian Church of America pastor doesn't just sound like a PCA pastor. That there is a sensitivity and a contextualization about our preaching that's important. In his second book uh, about this one, the, the orange one, The Practices of Christian Preaching, Essentials for Effective Proclamation, this is his dedication. I dedicate this book to my three daughters, Maya, Liliana, and Evelyn, and my prayer for you, for you remains the same, that someday each of you would become a woman of valor whose strength of character, courageous resilience, godly leadership, and bold action bless those around you and changes the world. Uh, last week was probably a bit of a harried week. Uh, the kids were off school. They were all at home because of the winter storm. Um, and we're kind of glad that it's this week and not last week. And we thank you that, uh, that Jen was fine with you leaving and being a part of us for these few days. Uh, this book underscores, again, that there's a core Christian confession. And then once you have that core Christian confession, you practice conviction and context and clarity and concreteness and creativity. So I would say that he's got the, the sort of the Beeson agenda down, and then what do we do? And especially in this context, because I don't think we spend a lot of time talking about the contemporary culture and crossing those boundaries. And so this is especially important for us to hear, because I think we spend a lot of time on the basics, on the fundamentals. So this is good for us to work with and hear. Let's pray together. Lord God, thank you for your presence with us right now. Uh, we do pray for Jared now as he comes and presents. We pray for a certain freedom uh, and that your Holy Spirit might work in our hearts and through his words. Together we praise you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. It's good to be with all of you again. I'll try to get this mic fixed for you. Can you all hear me okay? All right, good, good. Well, thank you so much uh, to uh, Dr. Webster. Thank you to Dean Sweeney, to the, the, all, of, all of my friends, colleagues here, uh, of course, for, for your kindness, your hospitality, uh, for your generosity. Uh, it, it was a harried week last week. Let's just be real. Uh, and we also have two foster care kids, so we had five kids at home uh, last week, and uh, we were doing the best that we could. And uh, if, it, if, like I said at the sermon on Tuesday, if, if uh, the lectures had been scheduled for last week, I, would, I wouldn't have been, been here. So I'm grateful uh, that the skies cleared, that the temperature went up, and uh, that I find myself here this morning. Uh, thanks again to Dean Sweeney. I didn't get to uh, say this on Tuesday since uh, the chapel time is a little bit shorter. I have a little longer now. But when I think of Dean Sweeney, I'm reminded of a Jonathan Edwards sermon, uh, The True Excellency of a Gospel Minister. Uh, and Edwards says that one must be possessed with both heat and light. If one has light and does not have heat, 
One is like an ignis fatuus, a, a foolish flame. Uh, someone, uh, a foolish flame is like a gas flame that comes up in a, 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 a marshland. It's here and it's gone. It can actually be misleading as light. Uh, but the gospel minister must also be possessed with heat, a fervency, a warmth of spirit, a desire, a commitment uh, to see God's people known by God. Uh, so a minister must both have heat and light in his preaching. And what you have in your dean is someone possessed with both heat and light, intelligence on fire, uh, the right leader at the right time. And so I give thanks. Give thanks for him and for this school. Well, uh, as you see from our title, uh, this is where we're headed today. The God who sees and calls us in the wasteland, or in the wild, rather. The God who sees and calls us in the wild. And just give me one moment while I get my papers together on our, on our desk here. Well, the story begins this way. It's with a man in search for somewhere to rest his head. And the lines begin, As I walked through the wilderness of this world, I lighted on a certain place where was a den. And I laid me down in that place to sleep. And as I slept, I dreamed a dream. So begins John Bunyan's classic, The Pilgrim's Progress, this religious allegory about Christian a man who is on a search, a quest for truth and freedom, a man who has a deep longing to be found by God. Uh, this book, published in 1678, of course, has been read by hundreds of millions of people, spanning five centuries, dozens of languages. So across the centuries and across the world, people have read about this man in a crisis, this person on a journey, one who somehow is uniquely himself, but also represents every person. And according to the British literary theorist W.R. Evans, this opening paragraph is, quote, one of the most famous in all of literature. Perhaps you know the story. Uh, Christian begins in the city of destruction, and that's his hometown, and he ends his journey in the celestial city, the place which is to come. But in order to get from here to there, he must walk through the wilderness of this world, a phrase that we'll return to shortly. When he beckons his wife and children to come, uh, they refuse, unpersuade, unpersuaded, unmoved by his appeal. Uh, his neighbors, obstinate and pliable, attempt to bring him home by force. Obstinate gives up quickly and says, I will be no companion of such misled, fanatical fellows. Uh, the other one, pliable, goes with him part of the way, intrigued by the promises of paradise, but turns back at the first sign of trouble when they slip into the slough of despond. From this point forward, Christian must travel alone. Uh, he finds a space of opportunity, a space of hope, when he arrives at the wicked gate. And at the wicked gate, he comes to a wall, uh, a fortified wall, better known as the wall of salvation. And as he goes along that wall, he doesn't walk, he runs. However, he's weighed down. He has to run, quote, with great difficulty because of the load upon his back. And then, in this beautiful scene, he arrives at what is called the place of deliverance, a place, quote, somewhat ascending, end quote, with a cross at its center and a sepulcher below. And there at the cross, Bunyan writes, Christian's burden loosed from his shoulders and fell from his back and began to tumble and continued to do until it came to the mouth of the sepulcher where it fell in, and I saw it no more. Here in this climactic moment, Christian's agony, his burden, gives way to relief, for there is one who brings him, quote, rest by his sorrow and life by his death, end quote. Christian wipes away the tears. Three angels appear on the scene and reassure him. He gives three leaps for joy, bursts into songs of praise as he wipes away tears of joy. 
at this moment, he knows that his journey to the celestial city is far from over, but he is also liberated by the removal of the load upon his back. It's a powerful story. We find ourselves in it somewhere, right? Rejection from family, doubt and fear, trials and, tempta and temptations, voices that call us to turn back, burdens impossible to carry, the power of conversion, freedom from sin. Uh, these and many other themes speak to us at a visceral level, at an existential level, regardless of where we are on the theological spectrum or where we come from in our background. And perhaps because of that rhetorical and emotional and spiritual appeal, we would pass over that first sentence too quickly as I walk through the wilderness of this world. It's a provocative metaphor, isn't it? It's one that frames the way that we think about the relationship between this world and the next. In Christian's case, to get from the city of destruction to the celestial city, he must pass through the wilderness, endure the wilderness, travail the wilderness. And we know this not just because in this opening sentence, but throughout the pilgrim's progress, the metaphor persists. Christian must go through a wilderness that is dangerous, unproductive, and evil space in order to get to where he is, get it, uh, where he is headed. The Puritans picked up this language when William Bradford arrived near the shores of Cape Cod. He described it as a desolate wilderness that stretched far beyond one's ability to see. Cotton Mather, when he spoke about the, the uh, destruction of the, the ship, the Lady Arabella, said that Lady Arabella left the paradise of England only to arrive in the fearful and desolate wilderness of America. Uh, as the ship was unable to, to continue, uh, Winthrop also, or Mather rather, also used this language to say that Lady, the Lady Arabella had passed from the wilderness of this world in order to get to a heavenly paradise. Now when it comes to scripture, we do not need to look very long or hard to find the wilderness as a dangerous place. Indeed, the Bible uh, portrays the wilderness as a site of contestation, a space of temptation, rebellion, judgment. A people murmur in the wilderness. A generation dies off in the wilderness. Jesus is tempted by the evil one in the wilderness. Now, although negative portrayals of the wilderness in Scripture should not be overlooked, let me suggest that the odds are quite low that we will overlook them. If we swing the pendulum too far in that direction, we will fail to see or we will misunderstand the possibilities of the wilderness as well. Quite often, what we find is this. Wandering individuals and communities experience epiphanic encounters with a preaching God in the wilderness. Say that again. Wandering individuals and communities experience epiphanic encounters encounters with a preaching God in the wilderness. Could it be that the same God who meets us at the place of deliverance and in the celestial city also sees fit to meet us in the wilderness of this world? Indeed, could it be that though the wilderness is a dangerous place, could it also be that a space of danger is also infused with being a space of encounter? What if a site of contestation is also a site in which there are possibilities for transformation? What if the New Testament commentator R.T. France is right when he claims that in Jewish thought to be in the wilderness was to be prepared for a new beginning with God? It turns out that in the pages of Scripture, the wilderness can be a place of confrontation and rebellion and judgment, but the wilderness can also be a place in which God sees and calls an individual or people to something new, indeed to a new beginning, to the possibilities of transformation born out of confrontation. The wilderness not only functions as a space of divine encounter, but also as a space of spiritual transformation and supernatural calling. Here's Robert Barry Leal in his book, Wilderness in the Bible. 
Divine encounter and call are wilderness-related, if not wilderness-dependent. That is to say that the God we worship is a preaching God in the wild, who also is especially good at seeing and calling individuals and communities in the there, out, there. Now, to illustrate these themes of seeing and calling, what I would like to do now is feature two stories from Scripture that uh, will be familiar to many of you. Uh, the first is found in Genesis 16. The second one is found in Exodus 3. Uh, so what I want to do is start with the God who sees, the God who sees us in the wild, and that's Genesis 16. Now, the context of Genesis 16 is, of course, Genesis 15, and a chapter in which God makes an audacious promise to Abram concerning his future, concerning the future of his family. You may remember this story. The Lord takes Abram out to the stars, illuminating the night sky, and God says to him, so shall your offspring be. They will be too numerous to count. God also promises Abram a son through his own flesh and blood, and then comes the ritual to seal the covenant. Abram falls into a deep sleep, and God walks through the torn pieces of animals arranged by Abram to demonstrate the depth of his commitment to his covenant, to Abram, and to his family. Now, we know from personal experience that time so often has a way of weakening our resolve, especially when it comes or when it seems that God is slow in keeping his promises. One of my professors in college, Scott Haifman, who's now a New Testament scholar or professor emeritus, used to say, circumstances consistently call into question the promises of God. And so the backdrop for Genesis 16 is Abram and Sarai's interaction with an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. And we learn in verse 3 of Genesis 16 that 10 years have passed from the time that God made his audacious promise in Genesis 15 to what transpires in Genesis 16. Now, we do not necessarily like to hear our biblical heroes cast this way, but it seems to be the case that Genesis 16 tells the story of a mistreated Egyptian maidservant who is forced to serve as a pawn in a chess match of marital dysfunction. It begins with Sarai blaming God for her infertility, in verse 2, she devises a plan to build her family through Abram, sleeping with her maidservant Hagar. Abram sleeps with Hagar in verses 3 through 4, and she becomes pregnant. Hagar is so upset and traumatized that she begins to hate and even despise her mistress. Sarai blames uh, Abram for the rift in verse 5. Abram chooses inaction rather than intervention as a force for reconciliation in verse 6. And we read also in verse 6 that Sarai, quote, mistreated Hagar, a verb which was frequently used in the Old Testament in the context of physical or psychological abuse. This is Nahum Sarna, the Jewish commentator, who writes, the Hebrew verb here implies that Sarai subjected Hagar to physical and psychological abuse. Now, almost instinctively, many biblical commentators rush to find various ways to sanitize the story and somehow absolve Abram and Sarai of responsibility, such as by saying that it was a common practice in the ancient Near East for people to build their family through their maidservants, and that is partially right. But in so doing, sometimes one would neglect the particular promise found in chapter 15 that it would be through Abram's son, his own flesh and blood, the implication being that through Abram and Sarai's seed, God would fulfill his promise. It's often easier to overlook that part. Moreover, many neglect a more basic aspect of the Abram and Sarai story, which is that God had called Abram and Sarai to be uncommon rather than common, to be peculiar and different rather than just like everyone else. Let's just put it this way, peculiar instead of predictably ancient Near Eastern. Other commentators rush to the phrase, Hagar despised her mistress, and say that this text is primarily about rivalry. And yes, there is an element of rivalry here. 
and there is a dynamic at play that Hagar is young and Sarai is old and Hagar is a maidservant and Sarai is Abram's wife and Hagar is fertile and Sarai is not. And this will not be the end of the tension between them if you read later in the book of Genesis. But let me suggest to you that an inordinate emphasis on rivalry fails to account for the vast power differentials in the relationship. Sarai is a person in power and Hagar is not. Sarai has means and Hagar does not. Sarai is Abram's wife of a particular nationality and Hagar is not. Sarai can say no to sexual intercourse with Abram and Hagar cannot. By focusing too much on the phrase, Hagar despised her mistress, we focus too little attention on the phrase, Sarai mistreated Hagar. The word, as I said, mistreat is often linked to abuse. And no one wants to think of Abram and Sarai this way, as abusive toward their servants. But the language of the text will not allow us to escape this conclusion. Here is another Jewish commentator, this time Matiteehu Sevat, who makes this insightful observation concerning the irony in the text itself. Sarai does to a child of Egypt what the Egyptians would later do to Sarai's children. So we have to ask, how safe would it have been for Hagar in Abram and Sarai's household? So safe that a poor pregnant Egyptian servant concludes that she would be safer traveling alone on a desert road back to Egypt than she would be in their house. Think about that for a moment. She concludes that she would be safer as a poor pregnant foreign maidservant traveling alone than she would be in their house. And so imagine her for a moment a poor pregnant foreign slave woman on a wilderness road to Egypt, perhaps scared, perhaps in danger, perhaps feeling all alone. But where she flees is especially relevant to the story and, of course, relevant to this lecture. She goes into the wilderness. Now, before we get to that part, let me just make one brief point of application. Sometimes this text has been used as a text of terror. That's a Phyllis Tribble term. But I find it curious that especially for marginalized and depressed women, not only in the United States, but throughout the world, this text is seen as a text of hope. How could it be then that it would be seen that way? Perhaps the answer is that Hagar is not just a historical figure, but also a symbol. Hagar is the young girl living in a developing world who has acid thrown in her face simply because she's a girl. Hagar is the high school girl robbed of her virginity by her prom date or the college student whose boyfriend forces her to get an abortion. Hagar is the Honduran woman breastfeeding at the border whose infant is taken from her arms. She is an African-American woman who deals with racism and sexism at one and the same time. She is a victim of harassment and assault. She is really anyone who has survived patterns of abuse in their families or from others in position of trust. The question is not so much whether or not there are still Hagars wandering through the wilderness. The question is whether or not there is hope for them. And according to this passage, the answer to that question is yes. It seems that Hagar, a poor pregnant foreign slave woman, is traveling alone on a wilderness road to Egypt, but according to Genesis 16, she is most certainly not alone. Verse 7 reads this way. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert and said to her, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? The angel found her on the desert road. Let me just make a few observations. 
This is the first time in Scripture that an angel of the Lord appears to a person. Yes, God appears to Abram one chapter earlier, but in chapter 16, we have the introduction of the phrase, the angel of the Lord, which occurs 48 times in the Hebrew Scriptures, shows up eight times in the book of Genesis, two times in Genesis 22, the sacrifice of Isaac, and six times here. The first time, and it occurs six times. The angel of the Lord is the first one in the story to call her by her name. Sarai does not call her by her name, and neither does Abraham or Abram. Go sleep with my sa slave, we read in verse 2. I put my slave in your arms, we read in verse 5. Your slave is in your hands, Abram says in verse 6. But to the angel of the Lord, Hagar has a name. And here's where I start to feel my help coming. I'm so glad that I know a God who knows my name. The angel of the Lord finds her. I'm reminded of the Francis Thompson poem from the 19th century in which God is portrayed as a hound of heaven. I'm also glad that God is especially good at finding us, that God is in the finding business. God is able to find Jonah on a ship headed for Tarshish and redirect him toward his divine plan. God is able to find Saul on a Damascus road and set him loose for the sake of divine mission. A woman searches and searches and searches. She sweeps the house and searches carefully for a coin that has been lost. And when she finds it, upon recovering it, she gathers together her friends and neighbors and says, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that was lost. The gospel is not so much about we ha how we have sought and found our way to God. Rather, it is about how God has sought and found his way to us. The angel of the Lord finds her in a peculiar place in the wilderness. What we see also is a pattern of action that begins here and continues. The pattern begins in this chapter and continues, some would argue, in... Uh, Jacob wrestling with God, or in Elijah in the Kerith Ravine. We could also say, as we'll say shortly, that it occurs with Moses on the far side of the, we, uh, of the wilderness. Some would go so far as to say that Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones, it is no accident that it is in a desert valley where that vision takes place. And then we move it forward to John the Baptist, and yes, to Jesus. The story also reveals God's concern for outsiders. Here's Brueggemann. God has not exclusively committed himself to Abraham and Sarah. God's concern is not confined to the elect line. There is passion and concern for the troubled ones who stand outside that line. And so the God of the nation is the God of everyone else. Are you not the same to me as the Egyptians? The Lord says in Amos. This is something that's often overlooked in a story like this concerning the character and the heart of God. That's why someone who fled violence in Guatemala could name a book, The God Who Sees, Immigrants, the Bible, and the Journey to Belong. Karen Gonzalez. Because the angel of the Lord who finds her, in verse 7, invites her to call her son Ishmael and then makes an audacious promise that your offspring will be too numerous to count. Does that sound familiar? But the angel invites her to call her son Ishmael, which means the God who hears, because the God who finds is also the God who hears her cries of misery. Then, as the story concludes, we find this peculiar and powerful moment that Hagar gives a name to God. She says, you are the God who sees me. That is why the place is called Be'er Laharoi, the place in which God sees us. Isn't God the one who's usually supposed to be doing the naming? Abram to Abraham, Sarah, Sarai to Sarah, Jacob to Israel, on it goes. 
But here, a poor pregnant foreign maidservant gives God a name. And so a story that has somehow been used, sometimes been used as a text of terror can often be translated by those who are cast as outsiders into a story of hope. For they believe in a God who is especially good at turning things around. And here's Karen Gonzalez, who had to flee violence in Guatemala, who sees a story of hope here. Hagar in the desert reminds us all, reminds all of us, that the spirit can be found in the places we least expect, with the poor, the outcasts, the enslaved people, the domestic help, and the foreigners. God is present with anyone who is treated as a human resource instead of a human being. God shows up not just for the master and mistress of the house, and the native citizens with rights, but with the undocumented maid in the kitchen. So God makes clear to Hagar in the wilderness that he is not just the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but also the God of outsiders. God makes clear in the wilderness that he is a God who hears our cries, responds to our afflictions. He finds us. He hears us. He sees us. God makes a promise to her. God offers hope to her. For she's faced with a choice between dying in the wilderness and going back and building her family. God makes clear to her that it's a choice between death and survival. And at this epiphanic moment, this great encounter, she chooses survival. She gave this name to the Lord. You are the God who sees me. So the God whom she encounters on a desert road knows her name, hears her cries, sees her afflictions, and dare we say on account of this bold and faithful declaration, you are the God who sees me, that could it be possible that Hagar becomes the first in a long line of wilderness preachers? For when you have seen the God who sees you, you have to share your story. So that's the first theme, the God who sees us in the wild. Second theme I want to introduce today, and we'll talk about the God who saves us and sends us in the wild tomorrow, but the second theme for today is the God who calls us in the wild, and I want to look briefly at Exodus 3. And that story, of course, concerns a man who has been charged with leading two different nations at two different junctures with a 40-year interlude leading sheep. <laughs> not your typical life plan. Uh, perhaps that old saying is true, the surest way to make God laugh is to tell him about our plan. So Moses ends up tending sheep because of a mistake that he made when he was young. The account in Exodus 2, 11 through 15 tells us that his mistake was far, far from minor. Something in him snapped when he saw an Egyptian mistreating a Hebrew slave, someone from his own flesh and blood. And if you look at verse 12 of chapter 2, you'll read, Looking this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. On account of such a decisive and sudden act of violence, word of his insubordination spreads quickly throughout the Israelite camp and through the Egyptian ranks, especially in light of Moses' position as an adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter. And when the news reaches Pharaoh, he responds swiftly to the threat. This is verse 15 of chapter 2. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. So Moses, a fugitive of justice, hides himself in Midian, an area east of what is now the Gulf of Aqaba or the Gulf of Elat. And there in that wilderness or that region, he meets Jethro, a priest of Midian. He marries Jethro's daughter, Zipporah. They have a child named Gershom, which means foreigner, for Moses says in Exodus 2, verse 22, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. Just about everything has changed in Moses' life in the span of about 12 verses. A new family, a new people, a new land, and a new occupation. Exodus 2 offers no clues as to how Moses chose to interact with God during the years that he was in Midian, only that it was a long period. That is Exodus 2, verse 23. However, what the text does make clear at the end of Exodus 2 is that God's heart remains with his people as they endure toil and bondage in Egypt. 
If you look at verses 23 through 25, you'll see that God hears them as they cry out in their suffering. God remembers his covenant. God looks on his people in their agony and according to verse 25, is concerned about them. God has remembered his people. What we do not know is whether Moses has remembered God. Exodus 3 begins with Moses performing his normal daily duties as a desert shepherd tending the flocks of his father-in-law. He leads the sheep through Midian, a region known as a dry and open wilderness country. For years, he has lived in relative anonymity as a fugitive of, fugitive of justice, but it seems that something, or better put, someone, is waiting for him in the there out there as he wanders to the far side of the wilderness and comes to Horeb, the mountain of God. That's Exodus 3, verse 1. A significant number of Hebrew scholars, or Hebrew Bible scholars, too many to name here, claim that it is no accident that God encounters Moses on the far side of the wilderness. A wilderness tradition that begins in the book of Genesis, and in particular with Hagar fleeing to Egypt, that continues with Jacob wrestling with God, now endures with Moses shepherding the flocks in Midian as a voluntary exile, hoping to leave Egypt behind him. Moses thinks that he is alone, but he is not alone. Moses thinks that he's far enough away from God's plans as possible, when in fact he's precisely in the place that he needs to be. Somehow, without the wilderness, he cannot be who he needs to be before Pharaoh. And he, he cannot be who God has called him to be before Israel. So it seems that the same Moses who went through palace training also needed wilderness training in order to be ready to lead. So Ulrich Mauser observes that the wilderness was a place of God's initial and fundamental revelation to his people, for here in Exodus 3 we have the Tetragrammaton, the revelation of the divine covenant name. So here, on the far side of the wilderness, God reveals his covenant name. Lynn Wall argues that the wilderness is a place of divine encounter where defenses are stripped away. I'm reminded of something Haddon Robinson used to say, just when you think that all you have left is God, you realize that God is enough. Everything has been stripped away in the space of divine encounter. J. Gerald Jansen observes that the wilderness was a setting for encounter with the power of the possible. Robert Barry Leal, who I mentioned earlier, says that wilderness plays a crucial role at all critical junctures of Moses' existence. And here, in this space, his communication with God appears to take place exclusively. Notice that Moses does not endure or escape the wilderness as Bunyan's character Christian might endure or escape it. Rather, he must face it. In the wilderness, he will experience both divine encounter and divine call. And in this dangerous region, his life will not come to an end. One might argue that here in this space, his life begins at least the part of his life that's most consequential to the nation he'll serve. And so when the Lord calls Moses from the burning bush in Exodus 3, verse 4, he calls his name twice, Moses, Moses. Now in Western culture, parents like me who call their child's name twice usually are not in a good mood. Usually that means you're not listening, you need to pay attention Hello, I need to get your attention. I'm going to call your name more than once until you listen. But according to Doug Stewart in his commentary on the book of Exodus, and I'm quoting from him now, in ancient Semitic culture, addressing someone by saying his or her name twice was a way of expressing endearment, that is, affection and friendship. Moses would have understood immediately 
that he was being addressed by someone who loved him and was concerned about him, end quote. Of course, God communicates to Moses that he must show appropriate reverence, take off your sandals. But notice that the reverence is also in the context of relationship. Moses is not struck down, though afraid. Moses is reassured. Though God is holy, God mediates divine holiness in a manner that is accessible to Moses. God calls his name twice a form of endearment. It's important also to see that God's care in the wilderness extends beyond Moses to an entire people. God's call takes place in the context of God's concern for a nation that has endured 400 years of bondage. Just as God knows the name of Moses as he hides himself in Midian, so also God knows the names and the stories of an entire community, an entire nation that has suffered in bondage. And here's where I think Howard Thurman can help us. I can count on the fingers of one hand the number of times that I have heard a sermon on the meaning of religion, of Christianity, to the man who stands with his back against the wall. It is urgent that my meaning be crystal clear. The masses of men live with their backs constantly against the wall. They are poor, the poor, the disinherited, the dispossessed. What does our religion say to them? The issue is not what it counsels them to do for others whose need may be greater, but what religion offers to meet their own needs. The search for an answer to this question is perhaps the most important religious quest of modern life. Since I'm in Birmingham and visited Montgomery on Monday, the one book that Dr. King carried in his briefcase everywhere was Howard Thurman's Jesus and the Disinherited. And so we see that the God who knows Moses by name and calls his name twice is also especially good at hearing and responding to people who stand with their backs against the wall, to use Thurman's phrase. Exodus 3, verse 7, if you look there closely, emphasizes God's seeing, God's hearing, and God's concern. Now we see a pattern of action here that the God who sees and finds and hears in Genesis 16 is also the God who sees and hears and is concerned about Moses and about an entire nation of people. I have seen the misery of my people. I have heard them crying out. I am concerned about their suffering, which is a reiteration of Exodus 2, 24 through 25. The cry of the Israelites have reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So I do want to tie it to the first part of the lecture and to the Hagar story. For the Lord says to Hagar, you shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. That's the same word in Genesis 16 that we find in Exodus 3. In fact, the same phrase. I have heard of your misery in Genesis 16. I have heard of their misery in Exodus 3. There's a vital connection, of course, between God calling an individual in the wilderness and God's mission to people in society. God's Mo uh, God gets Moses' attention, not only to find him, to see him, to hear him, but also to alert him to the gravity of human need. Calling takes place in connection to human misery. It resists interiority for its own sake or abstraction from the realities of a broken world. Notice that God does not say to Moses, your cries have reached me, Moses. I have heard about your loneliness in Midian. No, it is the cries of the people that have reached God's ears. God has heard about their suffering, and Moses must come to understand the connection, that there's a connection between divine encounter and supernatural call and its connection to the participation in divine mission. So Exodus 3 is not just a reassurance for preachers of our individual call, but I would argue that it's also a word of exhortation concerning human need, a corrective against any instincts toward hyper-individualism, insularity, or casual indifference to those who suffer. Yes, God calls us as individuals, and yes, God's word of hope is for the one 
and not just for the many. But notice also that in Exodus 3, God connects the needs of the one to the needs of the many. Christians cannot live the life that Jesus describes without engaging the world around them. They cannot make disciples of all nations if they stay on the mountain where they meet Jesus. Just as it is with Moses' call, perhaps the neighbors who are most proximate to us might not actually be the neighbors of, of greatest need. I think of a line from C.S. Lewis's book, A Grief Observed, not just my idea of my neighbor, but my neighbor. Not just my idea of God, but God. The word of hope that comes both to individuals and to communities comes primarily through answers to questions. Moses asks, when people say, what is his name? What should I tell them? And God's answer comes back, I am who I am. Now, from time to time, preachers like to extrapolate on that a little bit and like to say that before the seas were hung in the balance, God was there. Before the mountains were cast into place, God was there. Before time began to run and the sun began to shine, God was there. Before was, was, before is, is, before will be, will be, God is, I am, that I am, omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. Before Abraham was, I am, Jesus says. And even with all the dynamic power of the revelation of the divine name, the tetragrammaton, I am who I am, also says to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is my name, the Lord, the God of your fathers. So how can it be that God is both I am that I am in the wilderness and the God of our fathers in the wilderness? And we need look no for further than God's answer to Moses' objection in verse 12. On the far side of the wilderness, God says to Moses, Go, I am sending you to Pharaoh in verse 10. God calls him from out of the wild of Midian back into the wild of Egypt. And when Moses asks God, and responds, who am I? At this pivotal, pivotal moment, God offers the same promise to him that he offers to us, which is, I will be with you. The one who is I am that I am is also I will be with you. The one who is beyond us is also the one who is with us. In the context of encounter and call in the wilderness, the one who is extra nos is also pronobis. Years ago, um, when I was teaching at a, another school long ago, far away, <laughs> I had a student, uh, we'll call him James. Uh, and James was a preacher's kid who led a rebellious lifestyle for most of his teens and 20s, lived in the city, and wandered far from God. Yet, God found him, God heard him, God saw him, God met him, God transformed his life. And in a, in a miraculous act of divine intervention, he found himself at a seminary preparing for local church ministry, just like his dad before him. But James used to uh, like to encourage fellow seminarians. And here's what he would say to them. He would say, even when you're not sure about you, God is still sure about you. Moses offers God five excuses. And there's a credibility excuse and an insufficient knowledge excuse and a giftedness excuse, and on and on it goes into chapter 4. Five excuses, and with every excuse, God reminds Moses that he's God, that he will be with him, and that even though he's not sure about him, that God is still sure about him. And so here, in this moment, in the wilderness, God sees Moses, finds Moses, calls him on the far side of the wilderness in order to engage him in pastoral ministry, in order to meet him, to look beyond his faults to his needs. And the question then remains, how will we respond to God's encounter with us, God's call to us, God's invitation to us to participate in divine mission even in the wilderness, and perhaps like Moses, we will make the same excuses. We have nothing to offer, we say. We lack confidence. We lack knowledge. We lack credibility. We lack durability. We say that our capacities are insufficient. 
that we do not possess adequate skill or eloquence or persuasiveness. Perhaps we believe that given our background and our history, who we are, where we've been, our past mistakes, that God would be better off calling someone else. But what if one of the lessons of Exodus 3 is that God is not waiting for someone else? What if God is especially good at using desert roads, far corners of Midian, sure on the way to Egypt, in order to transform weak vessels like Hagar and Moses into wilderness preachers? What if, even if you're not sure about you, God is? I'd like to take a moment now and see if anyone has any questions. Uh, we have just a couple of minutes before the uh, Preaching Institute luncheon. So I'll open it up to Q&A. Uh, we won't have much time for Q&A, and then we'll move on to uh, the Preaching Institute luncheon. Does anyone have any questions, comments, before uh, Dr. Webster closes our time? All right, well, I want to make myself available to you during the break before the luncheon. So if you'd like to ask me a question one-on-one, -on -one, I'd be happy to uh, talk with you. And I'll uh, pass it to well, Let's Dr. thank uh, Jared very much. Thank you. Thank you.